Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight, at least every week that I'm here. Sometimes I'm here. Uh, you all know, if you follow me any long, uh, any length of time, you know that I'm here on many weeks and I'm not here on every week. So that's just how it is. So I'm happy to be here with you this time. Um, I've got something that I'm actually very interested in wanting to talk to you about, and it's related to um, a kind of a project that I'm doing over at my website, Richard Olin Members, which, as I see it, is a, an attempt to reintegrate the different areas of UFO uh, research uh, so that we really have a kind of complete understanding of what, what it is we're dealing with. I mean, if you really think about it in the last you know, few years, we've had a lot of uh, increased emphasis in the media on UFO or UAP, uh, primarily dealing with some military encounters, the United States Navy. We've heard about the Tic Tac UFO. We've heard about a lot of the other recent sightings, particularly by the United States Navy. Uh, a lot of talk about disclosure. All of that's very interesting and it's good. It's good, I think, that we have it. But here's the thing. There's a lot that's left out. There's a lot that's left out of this conversation. And I mean, for one, I talked about the total, near total absence of a discussion of UFO crash retrievals, very important. Uh, and you can't, you can't lose sight of it. Another thing that I've been hammering away at, and I, I think a few other people have, is just the fact of the, the depth of the cover up of the whole UFO phenomenon. Like, this is, to me, this has been really the red line beyond which uh, mainstream establishment media coverage really just never wants to go for obvious reasons. you got a media that's totally tied into establishment, uh, power values, intelligence community, financial community. They, they, there's a lot of control over that media. We all know this. And I have personally believed for a long time that there's this red line uh, of like no-go areas for mainstream establishment control media coverage. And one no-go is like cover-up. Can't get it. It's an age of where you're never supposed to believe in conspiracy theories ever for the rest of all time, uh, I don't really think it's going to be helpful for them to promote the greatest conspiracy of all time, which is the UFO cover-up. I mean, what's bigger than that, really? So I don't think uh, that's really been covered, the whole cover-up. And there's a, a lot of other areas that have been overlooked. And one of them, a really important one that I think has been almost totally left behind in our discussion is the whole concept of alien abduction. I mean, you know, it's not like people don't know about it, but where do you really hear um, a lot of like deep, ongoing, current discussion about this phenomenon, which is so important. It's so fundamental to our uh, whole understanding of what this UFO subject is. And it's really never discussed. You know, I, I understand why some of the folks are on TV. Lou Elizondo, he doesn't want to go there. They're they're trying to to get a public conversation about a subject that you know the, the mainstream and the public is just so far behind on this. Uh, getting into alien abduction that's difficult, but the fact is this: the UFO subject has one amazing steep learning curve. This is not something that you just traipse into and think, oh yeah, I'm just going to figure this out really quickly. Does not work that way. And, and I've seen a lot of very smart people, very well educated. They think, oh, yes, I can figure this out. Let me go take a look at this. And you see, like they go through all the same, uh, basically kindergarten level questions that everyone else has to go through when they first jump in here. They think it's going to be easy. And then they realize, holy crap, I'm in, <laughs> I'm in quicksand here. All right, this is way deeper. I remember when I started uh, over a quarter of a century ago, um, I don't know if I had, I had a little bit of that attitude. I thought, well, I'm just going to go and spend a couple of months, see if I can figure this out. Is this a thing? Is this not a thing? And, you know, you just get sucked right in because this subject, that's what it does. You know, you get one question solved and it opens up a dozen more. And then you uh, ask this other, one of these new questions, and that opens up more and more. And it just never stops. And that's the power of the UFO subject. It's like this great teacher really is like a great teacher. Like you don't, you don't walk up into some uh, temple or in a cave where some hermit's been living for 50 years, has got all the spiritual wisdom and say, I demand you tell me everything you know. Like it doesn't work like that. And in a sense, the UFO subject is a bit like that. Like you don't, just don't go in thinking you're going to figure this all out right away. And in that spirit, 
I'm going to talk about four different interpretations of the alien presence. And, and I just want to invite you to explore this the way that I'm trying to explore it, which is not as a definitive, uh, like we've got all the answers here. Because I don't really think it's quite that easy. And I'm going to discuss four ways of looking at this that are each has its own uh, power and draw for those individuals who look at it. And you may very well have an interpretation that you think is the right one. The one true religion, the one true interpretation. Okay, fine, good for you, but I'm going to talk about four here. In fact, I'm just going to do a spoiler alert. They are skeptic, non-spiritual, new age, and Christian. And I'm going to talk about each, each of them in its turn, and I'm going to give you my own take, and we can move on from there. So anyway, all of this is part of a, uh, I guess I could say a personal project that I have, which I call Reintegrating Ufology, essentially bringing all, all of the important themes of this amazing subject so that we can at least have a chance to understand a little bit better just what it is we're dealing with and, and with some sense of completeness. Like it's just, uh, again, you know, I understand why some of the folks in the, you know, who deal with the mainstream media are, uh, are kind of restricted in the way that they approach this. We get it, but it's, it is for us, those of us who actually are seriously and deeply into this, to remind ourselves there's a lot going on here, there's a lot of weirdness going on in this, and it's not a good idea to run away from it and pretend like it doesn't happen. It's not, it's not a good idea to pretend that you, the UFO subject behaves, because the fact is it does not behave. It does not behave in the logical, sensible way that we all wish it would. It just doesn't happen like that. Okay, so recently, uh, as in yesterday, I watched a screener of an upcoming documentary treatment on UFOs and aliens. In fact, Tracy and I watched it uh, together, and we uh, this is a, a treatment by J3 Productions, that's the company, and it's part of a series that they have been working on. The series is called Extraordinary. Uh, they've already had two previous episodes uh, and in fact, at the end of this month, they're going to release part three, which is what we saw last night. Part three is called Extraordinary uh, Revelation or The Revelation, I think. I can't remember. Revelation. So um, for the record, I am personally in numbers two and three. So I'm in the, the new one, the upcoming one. That's why we got a screener. And I'm thinking, so why not plug the damn things? But that's not really why I'm talking about it here. For the record, I don't get residuals. I don't get back end out of any of those. But I do like what they've done. And I think that these are actually worth checking out. And I have a link to the new one below here. You go, by all means, go take a look at it. Look at their website. They, um, the movie becomes available uh, November 30th. That's Tuesday, November 30th, so later this month. And for the record, that day, um, I will have an, I will post an exclusive interview that I've done with the director of that film, John Sumple. And one member of the cast who's like me was interviewed for it, and that's Timothy Alberino. And um, Timothy, someone that Tracy and I met a couple of years ago, we really like Timothy a lot. And um, so I'm going to have that. That will premiere also on November 30th, later in the day at 8 p.m. Normal's time for the Richard Olin Show. And it's on all the basic platforms, Apple, Amazon, Google Play. This is the movie. Uh, Microsoft, Voodoo, Vimeo, whatever. Okay, done. I'm not trying to plug that thing, but I just wanted the, that screener was actually what triggered my topic right now. Uh, the last thing I want to say about that is that they, they did a, what I felt was a very good treatment in one part of it, which dealt with three aspects of the alien presence or three interpretations of the alien presence, three ways of looking at it. Uh, and you can see that I've added a fourth, but uh, they interviewed David Jacobs. He gave one kind of look at the alien presence, basically. Uh, many of you follow this, you know, aliens are here. They're not nice. They're, they're a problem. We need to deal with it. They're dealing with a planetary takeover. They also interviewed Mary Rodwell, who's an abduction researcher in Australia, who has a very radically different interpretation of this phenomenon, um, what we might call more of a new age oriented interpretation. I'll get into that. Uh, they also interviewed L.A. Marzulli, who's a, a, we can call a Christian ufologist, He's very smart, very interesting guy, and he had a particular interpretation. In fact, Tim Alberino, 
was also kind of in line with that interpretation. So that was the Christian interpretation. So you've got in this treatment, you got three radically different ways, okay, of understanding the alien presence in our world. Now, to me, what was remarkable about this is that there were, uh, at least when I when I think about, uh, I'm going beyond the film here now. When I just think about uh, like Dave Jacobs' interpretation or Mary Rodwell's or or Christian interpretations of this, what you find is that there are not that many differences in the specific details of what researchers believe is going on, okay? It's actually, there's a tremendous amount of overlap there. What is different, what is radically different is in how they interpret this. So for example, they will all basically agree, abductions are happening. They will uh, generally agree that uh, to understand the important details of what happened, you usually will require hypnotic regression. Not always, but generally speaking, yes. Uh, for the most part, some of the Christians will disagree on this one, but there's a, a widespread understanding that for the most part, people are basically helpless against these beings. Yes, there is a definite Christian school of thought that says if you pray, uh, you call, invoke the name of Jesus, that they will not abduct you. Now I've listened to, I've talked to Bud Hopkins about this years ago, and um, he had a very strong opinion that that was not true. So you can argue about this, but generally speaking, there's the sense that these beings are on, operating on a level far beyond us. And there's not a whole lot that we can do about it. If they want to take us, they're going to take us. Uh, another point of agreement, even among, this is among the new age group is that these experiences are usually unsettling. They are often frightening. They are often even traumatic to those people who have uh, an alien abduction experience. Another point in common is that uh, the abducting beings are usually, not always, but often described as uh, grays, like this short, you know, gray skin, big black wraparound eyes. Uh, not every time, but there's, I would say that's very common and you get that across the board. Another thing that is universally recognized, I would think, is that these greys or the abductors generally operate covertly, okay? And then another thing that you get, and this is, again, across the board, is that these beings are planning something big to take place in our future and very possibly our near future, now, that's really kind of interesting when you think about it. So what you have is this basic agreement from these three, let's call them schools of thought, all right? These general agreements come essentially from one fundamental source, seems to me, and that source are abductees who have undergone regressive hypnosis. Now, I want to take a little side road and talk about hypnosis a little bit, and then we're going to come back. So what you find is, um, okay, so first of all, the, the hypnoses are usually done because the person who had this experience I either, had, either had a UFO sighting that seemed incomplete somehow, like maybe with missing time, uh, or there was something else in the person's life that led them to think that there was something wrong. So this could be like a memory fragment uh, that didn't make sense. Uh, to them or some other strange reaction or a thing in their life that made them wonder if something happened that they could no longer remember and, and so on. So there's something going on that, and that triggers this idea that maybe hypnotic regression is a good idea. Now, I know, and you know, I'm sure that there are critics of regressive hypnosis. Uh, most of us have heard claims of false memory syndrome. And no one is saying that that's impossible. Like, could it be? that people are made to believe in things that never happened. And the answer to that, I think, is yes, that definitely can be the case. And it sometimes is the case in life. And we would be very foolish, I think, to deny this. I suppose I will just say that my own opinion after looking at this, I looked at quite a few cases of abduction, is that by and large, we are not dealing with false memory syndrome. That's not to say that every single thing an abductee remembers under hypnosis can be taken literally as exactly true. I'm not saying that. But uh, I do think that we're talking about some very, very definite trends. Like 
consider this. All right. All of this hypnotic regression became a thing to begin with because you go back over many years, especially the 1970s and 80s. All right. When back then, still a lot of the alien abduction process was not really well known by the vast majority of people. You still have a situation which these people were describing intricate procedures in virtually identical ways. So we're talking about the types of beings, um, the size of the beings, the behavior of the beings, uh, their appearance, like specific appearance, like what the things that they did, the, the procedures, the equipment seen by people, um, what the specific pieces of equipment did, uh, what the rooms look like, um, how the people were moved from one place to another, how they were taken, how they were returned, how these beings communicated with them, the kinds of uh, statements that they did communicate to the abductees. All of this and so much more had um, an incredible amount of consistency across geography, across demography, um, so much consistency that when you get to these early researchers like Bud Hopkins or Ray Fowler or Leo Sprinkle and then a lot of the other early abduction researchers, like they was getting them to think, okay, like something is going on here. <laughs> like this seems to be a real thing. Uh, these were coming in from all around the, the country and, and as cases developed around the world as researchers elsewhere started looking into this, you get a really incredible amount of consistency. And then later you get researchers like David Jacobs or John Mack, Yvonne Smith, Barbara Lamb, Kathleen Martin, uh, Denise Stoner, and many, many others have continued this work. And the fact is that there is a very large body of work here that describes um, a consistent phenomenon of alien abduction that appears to be taking place, like for real. That's a crazy thing to say. If you're a hardcore skeptic, you're like, come on, alien abduction. Well, let me talk about the skeptic um, uh, perspective in a moment. But first, I want to talk a little bit more about like why hypnosis? Like why has that become such a big thing? Um, and, and actually, let's ask this. Why have memories of alien abduction come largely through hypnosis? Well, I think that there's two reasons you can come up with. And first will be the skeptical reason. So a skeptic on this is going to say, well, yeah, it's a really good reason why this is coming out through hypnosis, because that's because alien abductions aren't really happening. And sorry to say, this is all in the mind. And it's brought about by a combination of, you know, uh, popular culture immersion in the UFO subject. It's all out there. And mostly well-meaning people who are still, they're guilty of leading the witness. Even if they think they're not leading the witness, they are doing it anyway. And the result is that they inadvertently are putting false ideas into someone's head. So that's, you know, I, and I think I'm being, I am being fair to the skeptical position. I think that's basically what a skeptic would probably say. Now, the other reason why, why do these memories come through hypnosis? Why, why does that happen? is that you could easily argue, which I would argue, that these beings, these aliens, um, seem to be very good at managing our minds and managing our memories. Uh, they are part of a general UFO presence in our world. And I think at this point, there's certainly many people willing to recognize that there is a real UFO phenomenon. So from that perspective, if you're willing to rec recognize there's true UFOs, it's not really much of a stretch to think that we're dealing with aliens, um, let's face it. And if aliens are here, then why would it be so hard to think that they're interacting with us in one way or another? Uh, why would it be hard to think that they've got advanced capabilities, advanced technology? Uh, you know, all of that actually is not illogical, okay? Uh, furthermore, when you look at the UFO phenomenon and you look at their behavior in apparent abductions, they are they seem to be very clandestine in their actions. Uh, and, and the incredible consistency that people are reporting is therefore likely because this is actually happening and that the hypnosis is necessary because these beings are very good overall at blocking our memories of the events. And that therefore, if you want to break those blocks, you need hypnosis. And really all hypnosis is, is um, I mean, there's different types of hypnosis. Yes, but really fundamentally, it's a way of relaxing your mind 
and to focus your mind in a place of quiet. We've all had a situation, even if you've never been hypnotically regressed, where you're kind of in a very kind of calm, focused state of mind and, and suddenly you remember things, right? That you hadn't remembered in a while. It's like, oh my God, that childhood memory. Th these things happen when you get into a certain state of, state of mind and that is what hypnosis does very well. And it can be done extremely well to do that. And I think um, it's absolutely a valuable tool for recovering genuine memories. Like this absolutely can be the case. And so that is why hypnosis is used. Okay. All of that is preamble. It's my little way of preparing the subject. So let's just dive into the four interpretations. So first, I suppose, let me just talk about the skeptical interpretation since I already just kind of started. Now, I am not a skeptic on alien abduction. So let me just put my cards on the table here and say that I do believe this is happening. Still, I want to be fair to the skeptical position, at least as much as I can. So first of all, a skeptic, uh, you know, a lot of UFO believers and believers in alien abduction like to think, oh, those skeptics, skeptics, they're just jerks. They're just trying to give us a hard time. It's not really true. All right. Like not every villain is a cardboard cartoon cutout of, you know, of your idea of an evil mustache twirling villain. There's a lot of scientists out there who actually on a personal level uh, want to be or w wouldn't mind being sympathetic to the ideas that we talk about here in ufology. But they've got uh, they've got a position here. And the, and the position is that uh, they for them to engage in a the subject, they require something that's kind of serve as scientific evidence, even if it's not proof, like some kind of evidence. And I think in the opinion of most scientifically, like really uh, strongly scientifically minded people, this subject of alien abduction does not meet acceptable standards. Uh, you know, first of all, you need access to data if you're a scientist, right? Data is very difficult. I mean, you can get anecdotal data from, from people. Someone says, yes, I had this experience. Okay, well, good. And you can collect that and you can kind of put together, um, you know, the, the best statistics that you can put together. But that's still not really the same, let's face it, of having hard scientific data that can be actually studied, quantified uh, to, the, to the satisfaction, let us say, of a serious scientist, at least in many fields. Another thing about science is that if you're going to study something, they require something that they would call falsifiability. And what that means is, like, if I make a claim to you, uh, it could be true, it could be false, but it, it's not valid if, if you have no ability to prove me wrong. So let's say, this is an example I used to love. Uh, what, if, what if I were to say to you, we are all, uh, this whole world, this whole universe is actually a tiny little speck of food on the plate of a giant, you know, he's eating a bowl of, of mashed peas, like in Britain. And he's, and we're in there and he's ready to eat us. And I'm like, this is going to happen. And you can say, well, that's a little crazy. And I'd say, well, prove me wrong. And the thing is like, how do you prove that wrong? Like there's a lot of crazy ideas out there that are not falsifiable. Like, you have no opportunity to prove that idea wrong. You could, you could come out with all of the measurements of the universe and the speed of light and everything else. Quant you can even go quantum on me. Won't matter. I can just say, nope. I've received a revelation and this is what I know. And so it's not falsifiable. Now, I'm not saying the phenomenon of alien abduction is on that level of, of uh, unfalsifiability, no. But it is difficult for uh, most people who have had such an experience really to be able to prove it, you know, satisfactorily to another person. That's part of the problem that we often have with alien abduction. So that's a problem. And, and a skeptic would could easily go on and say, look, there's a lot of cultural baggage in this. Uh, there's probably a lot of psychological issues with people who have claimed to have alien abduction. Uh, they can point out how our view, uh, our visual understanding of aliens seems to have evolved over generations from the 1940s and 50s to today. And they have evolved. All right. Um, now, that doesn't mean... So, so a skeptic would then would say, well, the solution is it's not real and you need help. Um, in my opinion, there are ways of, of discussing uh, a lot of these objections. And I don't know if I should really do that here or not. I probably should deal with this another time, but I will just say uh, it is entirely possible that 
uh, our understanding of how these aliens look has evolved for the reason that, first of all, they haven't evolved radically. They've evolved a little bit. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, secondly, they've evolved. It could be that we deal, we're deal we dealing with a phenomenon in which there is some level of psychological or mental manipulation that is going on. That does appear to be the case to me. And we do tend to perceive certain phenomena that we don't quite understand through our a cultural lens. So I do think it's entirely possible that some of these descriptions are effects of that. Let me come back to it. But anyway, that's a skeptical way of understanding this. And I just think we need to understand, we need to recognize that it's it's asking a lot of someone, especially someone who doesn't know a lot about the subject to begin with. And then and to say, yes, I want you to believe that I've been abducted by aliens because this happened to me when you when you're not able to give them uh, a whole lot for them to grab onto. It's difficult. It's a steep learning curve in this. I think most people who've gone through an abduction experience, they are well aware of this because they know it's very difficult to live with this type of reality. How do you just tell people? Like the answer is generally you don't. And it's a real problem. So let me move on to uh, another school of thought. I was going to call this originally the materialist school of thought that is in philosophical materialism then I just thought maybe non-spiritual is an easier way to, to call it. But um, this is this is like people like David Jacobs or Bud Hopkins, I think, would be uh, representatives of this. So these are researchers who, by and large, um, do not come across as overly spiritual or religious in their interpretation of this phenomenon. Their, attitude, their approach is they're looking at evidence as best they can. Alien abduction is a, is a difficult phenomenon to investigate, but they are they are going into the evidence. And uh, I would say in their assessment, they are trying to draw interpretations based solely on the evidence that they are getting. That doesn't mean that there's any more objective than other people, but I think that's the goal. Um, well, one thing that I've noticed when I, I listen to people like uh, Dave J Jacobs or Bud Hopkins, for example, is they are not, um, even though they're willing to say that these aliens have a very radically different psychology and probably in a lot of ways than we do, you really find that they're not generally afraid to ascribe human-like motivations, excuse me, motivations to these beings. In other words, uh, like in the, in the film, uh, Extraordinary Revelations, uh, there's one clip where David Jacobs does say, like, look, we human beings, we don't really know for sure about aliens, but we know what we are. We know we're kind of aggressive. We know that we're pretty good at wiping out or controlling other species. Uh, he says, is it really outrageous to think that other beings from elsewhere would be similar or could be similar? Are there other beings that would be aggressive or at least that would be, um, you know, looking out for themselves more than they look out for us? And in his opinion, it's like, yeah, that actually makes sense to me. That's an inference. That could be a guess, but it's not an outrageous guess. Let's face it, it's entirely possible. You could see all life forms um, have to compete. They have, life has to be aggressive if it's going to survive. You got competing life forms, uh, you know, in your little eco niche. Uh, if you if you don't, you know, it's, it's the survival of the fittest. That's what they used to say. And it's actually, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, you know, that's why trees grow tall. They're competing with other trees to get the sunlight and, and on and on and on. So there's a certain amount of aggression that is inherent very probably in maybe all life forms. And is it outrageous? So that anyway, that's one thing about this school of thought. Um, people like um, Jacobs and Hopkins would, would emphasize that there's a great amount of consistency of detail that they get from their people under hypnosis, um, you know, including including from uh, people doing hypnosis that are UFO skeptics. You know, think of someone like Benjamin Simon, who regressed Betty and Barney Hill back in 1961. He was skeptic on UFOs. He didn't believe in it, but he was still able uh, to extract very detailed accounts from Betty and Barney um, that he concluded they were abs they definitely believed what they were doing, and he didn't really know that what they believed was true but certainly the accounts that they gave him were remarkably detailed and consistent. So anyway, the, the, the materialist or non-spiritual school of thought would say, 
um, aliens are taking humans for reproductive purposes, that is to breed uh, alien-human hybrid type creatures. Uh, and moreover, they've gotten to a point, this is really Jacobs here, where these hybrids now look fully human. They look human. They live here. They can control us telepathically, neurologically. We cannot control them. Uh, another conclusion is that, well, they fully infiltrated our society. Uh, they are kind of sociopathic, psychopathic in their, uh, in their kind of method of being. Like these are, these are not good people by our standards. They can, like, like a true psychopath, they can mimic human emotions, but they don't really have them. They are, uh, you know, and he's getting all of this from his abductees who've, who've gone through regression with him. And they talk about their, their hybrid handlers, basically, who use them to learn about human society. This is where they're at, um, apparently, at this point, at least in his research. So uh, they're kind of sociopaths. These are not good people. Uh, and in his analysis, <clears throat> and this is a point where this is going to come up as one real difference with the new age research, but in his analysis, the hybrids are, uh, seem to be born on craft, not here on earth. They're born not here. They are raised and then they are introduced to human society. And this is why they require, uh, human guides to teach them basic skills, like how to cook a meal or how to, uh, um, you know, how to just have a normal interaction with another person. Like they're, they're not good at that, but they are good at neurological control and getting you to do things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. So, um, one of the things that he mentioned actually that, um, I'm, I'm really glad that we got to see this in the, in the, the film, which it will be available at the end of this month is he said, you know, a lot of the abductees I talk to discuss, uh, they'll talk, they, they there's a lot of consistency and they all talk about being trained for a future in crowd control. It's very bizarre. And he's like, why would you think that? Why Why would someone say to you, yeah, the aliens are training me. And what's the job they're training you? And oh, just crowd control. Like you go over there, get on that line, do this, do that. And uh, that's a bit bizarre. But according to his, his uh, assessment, this is in fact what many abductees told him. That doesn't bode well. Let's just put that right out there. That's not a good sign, right? If that is true, that's not a good sign. So his conclusion and I'm just going to use him to speak for this whole school of thought here. Um, this is not a good thing, all right? They are here. It's clandestine, and we are in trouble. And one of the big things that, of course, uh, he wrote about in his last book, Walking Among Us, is this idea of the great change. And this is something that a lot of the abductees he's talked to have said to him that their handlers have told them about. There's going to be a great change going to be a great change. What's this great change? They don't tell them. What is this great change? So his, D David's uh, interpretation of this was that this is their planetary takeover. They're going to come out with it and they're just going to like take over the whole thing. Alien overlords, get you in line, shut the hell up and eat your gruel. Don't complain. Uh, and then we're going to feed you into the machine and, and grind you. Who knows what they're going to do? I don't know. But that's and I shouldn't really make light of this because this is very serious. When you, you know, I know David and I have a lot of respect for him. And in his view, this is, this is really bad. Okay. And so this presence of these other beings, we're talking infiltration on a level that's like, you know, invasion of the body snatchers type of a scenario, not a good thing. And he believes this is going on worldwide. This is not just in your neighborhood or not just in the next state over. This is everywhere. Uh, and so that's his interpretation. So that's, that's, and how, how do you deal with something that dire? Well, that's a whole other thing. We're going to have to come back and explore this again. Now, uh, when you look at this, uh, let's call it a school of thought because it is a school of thought. There's no real spirituality here, right? There's no sense, uh, that these aliens are spiritually advanced. In fact, you know, you get the sense 
that is really quite the opposite. They're, they're sociopaths. They're psychopaths. They're manipulative, <clears throat> excuse me, of us to the highest degree. They are not our friends. That's that interpretation. Alien presence equals bad, equals very bad, very bad. So then you get, <clears throat> now you've got the new age. Let's call it the new age school. I think that's really the best word for this, which has, and this is an incredible thing to say, the exact opposite conclusion. Exact opposite conclusion. It's, it's really an extraordinary thing, like, because you've got, you've got, uh, Two groups of researchers here, not just like there's Mary Rodwell, who was in the film. Uh, there's Barbara Lamb, who I adore Barbara Lamb. I mean, she's just an amazing human being. Um, she's of this school of thought. And there's, um, you know, uh, I think Kathleen Martin might be. I don't want to speak for Kathleen. I know and respect Kathleen. Uh, possibly, I think maybe. And, there, and there's others out there. Yvonne Smith, I think, is a little bit. Um, I think Yvonne Smith, uh, you know, I interviewed her. I talked with her. She's, she's I think a little more balanced one way or the other. I think she tries to be neutral on this. But definitely there's a, a, a school of thought that we can call new age-like. And <clears throat> and in this school of thought, these gray aliens or these beings, they're just giving us information. Um, and, and moreover, there's this very deep spiritual interpretation, which is that we are all spiritual beings who prior to our incarnation in this world, into these bodies, uh, have already chosen to come into these particular vehicles. And so that we essentially are them and they are us. And, and this is absolutely a conclusion here. Uh, all, all of things that are happening here are done in this interpretation by previous agreement, spiritual agreement before you incarnate. So it's a cooperative thing. Even if you don't remember it, this is a cooperative venture. Now, um, you know, I, look, I have, I have um, anyone who's, who knows a little bit about what I've you know, been about for the last many of years knows that I'm not, I'm not a proponent of this interpretation. Um, I'm, I'm not a proponent of it. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm, I'm here to attack everyone who believes that belief system. I will say this. What is strange to me is that this school of thought basically sees the same thing. Human looking hybrids are here. You could say infiltrating our society, but they see it very differently. This is to help the planet. This is to help humanity uh, join the galactic community. And now here's where there's a real difference is in how they see the hybrids. To me, this is actually the, probably the biggest key difference. And, and it's not really discussed I almost never hear this talked about in the UFO community. And this is a very, very important difference. Um, whereas you have uh, the one school of thought, let's say the Jacobs people, the materialists, saying the hybrids are created on the ships and they are then introduced into human society. This is not what you hear in among a lot of the folks who are in, let's call it the new age school of thought here. In that interpretation, in that analysis, these hybrids are born here to human parents, or they are incarnated. They are star seeds. That's the word, all right? They are star seeds, and they have come to help the planet. And this is what they will tell you. And there's a lot of people who uh, claim to be star seeds. They are hybrids. Uh, one of their parents would be from another a world you know, wherever that world is, Arcturus or some other place. So they incarnate to help the planet. And, and many of them will say things like to make the ascension process a reality. You know, I mean, I remember um, I, had, I had a lot of criticisms, still do, of the whole concept of new age ascension. I just, I don't agree with this at all. It's my own opinion. Um, I remember in the buildup to uh, December 21st, 2012, it's almost a decade ago. You realize how long ago that was. Uh, to me, it was almost like yesterday. It was such a buildup. Uh, and there were lots of people saying, well, if you've got positive karma, 51% positive karma, you will ascend. The universe is going to flip a switch. The galactic plane will tilt in whatever this way is. And if you've got good karma, you will ascend. And, you know, depending on who you talk to, that meant something totally different. Um, some people, it was like... Um, 
you would develop a different type of a body. Like you would be living here on earth in a different body and you wouldn't need food. You wouldn't need all, it would be like, um, you know, like, you know, I mean, <laughs> I'm going to say this, the early Christian versions of the kingdom of God, which, you know, the resurrected would come from the graves and have perfect bodies and live here on earth. Uh, the uh, Some of the Ascension believers, I I believe, had a very similar concept. Uh, others, it was much more of a spiritual thing, like maybe their own version of heaven. I don't know. Changing frequency, changing their density. There's lots of language that was used for this. Then comes December 21st, 2012, and guess what? Didn't happen. Surprise, surprise. I actually talked to a person earlier that year in 2012 who, uh, God said, was a really smug, really smug, annoying person. It was a woman... And she's like, oh, well, I'm surprised you don't know much about this, Richard Dolan. And uh, uh, was like, well, I understand this because I have a spiritual orientation. Too bad that you're not heart-centered. You don't understand this. Uh, well, maybe you'll be lucky and you'll get it one day. And this person actually had stopped paying her rent or her mortgage or whatever, truly, because she believed that on December 21st, 2012, she wouldn't have to worry about that, those little things anymore. All that's going to go away. Well, I don't know what happened to her. I never saw her again. Good for me. Um, I don't know if she got evicted or whatever, or had to pay a lot of back payments to her uh, landlord or uh, bank. Oh, well. Anyway, Ascension did not happen, did not come. Um, but that belief remains. The Ascension concept has not gone away. That is what kind of blows my mind. Um and so you've got these hybrids or self-described hybrids, okay, who uh, say, like, I'm here to help the ascension process. And I'm, I'm going to be a bridge between, you know, these extraterrestrials or the galactic community and humanity or to bring uh, interdimensional level to relationships, whatever that means. But like, people will say this. Basically, to become more spiritual. And then we become part of them part of these the extraterrestrials and become part of the galactic community. So for them, that's a great shift. That's a great change, all right? And this is absolutely foundational to uh, their interpretation of alien abduction and alien encounter, all right? And, and a lot of, uh, let's call it new age uh, abduction research will emphasize, they'll say, look, this seems traumatic, but when you actually dig down, you find that these beings are really not here to harm us. They are here to help us. They're worried about us. We're, we're not going along a proper spiritual path or a proper civilization path. And they are going to help us and they're guiding us. All right. So that's, a, <laughs> needless to say, a radically different interpretation of this than hybrids are infiltrating our society and they're going to uh, you know, we're, we're going to lose the last bit of control over our lives that we think we even have. It's just going to, we're going to be complete uh, underlings of these other beings that have their own agenda. But that's not the case in the, in the new age view, um, which, you know, has to be said is very dependent on a spiritual worldview. It's dependent on a belief in reincarnation, even in soul agreements and the idea of, you know, etheric DNA in inside you rather than just the regular DNA and junk DNA. Um, but, but the big difference being these hybrids, uh, which, which really is a key part of that are not, they don't claim to be born on craft. They are born in society. This is the huge difference. And this is what is not, I don't think this is fully recognized, uh, or at least it's not fully discussed. It, it's, it's an important difference. And uh, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go on the record here and say that I have personally met many individuals in my time, particularly in the days when we would travel to conferences and things like that, uh, where I would meet people who would claim to be alien hybrids. All right, and uh, I'm just gonna say, like, I have never met one that I believed at all was an actual alien hybrid. I've I have not met one person ever that made me think, oh, wow, that's an actual alien hybrid. Never happened. Uh, I hold out hope that this can happen. And I'm not saying no such people exist. All right. But the ones who have claimed to be alien hybrids to me have 
never been believable to me. Not once. So, you know, now maybe uh, some of you have a different attitude about this. Okay, fair enough. And if you do, hey, you know what? Write a comment below. I don't always go through comments, but I'm going to go through these. I'm going to see what you write. And I'm curious what you have to say about this. Um, but for my part, I have not satisfactorily met such a person. Another thing that I'm just going to put this out here, and this is not as a result of any statistical analysis I've done or that I'm aware of, but I have, I have uh, observationally noted that probably 80, 90% of all the hype, alleged hybrids I've ever met are women. Now, is that really the case? Are there that, is there that much of a preponderance of female alien hybrids over male alien hybrids? Um, is, you know, why is that? Now, I, I would be shocked if that number is less than two thirds. Um, I would be shocked because I think it's more than two thirds. Yes, I think so. At least in my own experience. Um, now, would it be the case in reality that aliens who incarnate just prefer to, to incarnate as a woman as opposed to a man, you know, one might think that you'd have more of a 50-50 breakdown here. But that is, certainly doesn't seem to be the case, at least observationally, in the phenomenon of alleged alien hybrids. Again, I could be wrong. And if I am wrong, I will do a mea culpa on this. And if, if there's any statistics, I don't know if there are any, but it seems to me my own observation is that this is overwhelming uh, female phenomenon. And if that is the case, then I do think it's a fair question to ask what's going on here, because there's something that seems like there's something wrong here. Um, seems a little odd to me. So I just, I'll just leave that at that. Um, so I think as you can say, uh, as you can see, rather, I, I have some problems with the new age interpretation of alien abduction. Now, before I move on and talk about the Christian interpretation, uh, I will just say, <clears throat> I do not rule out all examples of positive interaction with these other beings. I do not, uh, nor do I rule out uh, all examples necessarily of um, like non-physical, uh, telepathic, or even what we might call spiritual interpretations of abduction. I do not rule that out personally. I think that there, uh, there are some cases that are really quite interesting to me. So I'm not here to dismiss it all, but I am here to say, <clears throat> in my opinion, a lot of that school of thought uh, is really dominated by an ideology that I think colors the uh, phenomenon in a way that, that is beyond evidence. Okay, that's what I'll say at this point. So let me move on to Christian interpretation. And now... Um, I'm at a handicap here because I'm not not a devout, I'm not a Christian per se. I have a lot of sympathy and a lot of interest in uh, Christianity. So let me just say that. I'll put that out there. Uh, I'm not anti-Christian in any way, um, but I'm not, I, I certainly don't have uh, the full like worldview that a lot of Christians, especially biblically based Christians have. So, um, but I have, I have a number of friends who are, and and they know that I respect them. Um, with the Christian interpretation of this, um, you know, you have a lot of emphasis on the fact that this is the alien abduction phenomenon is something that is not a good thing, first of all. Um, <clears throat> uh, in that sense, it's very similar to what people like David Jacobs or Bud Hopkins would say. But, but their way of looking at it is not in a materialist way, it's a much more overtly spiritual way, and particularly a way in which biblical interpretation is very, very important, obviously. And not simply, by the way, uh, like something like the book of Revelations, where, you know, you go down to like the mark of the beast, uh, and, you know, it's, if you have the mark on your forehead or your right hand, I think, um, you, you know, well, this is really going beyond alien abduction, but it's it's <laughs> this is more New World Order stuff. Mark of the Beast. Yeah, be careful because you won't be able to buy and sell if you don't have the Mark of the Beast. Whoops, what's that all about? Uh, but you still do have um, uh, interpretations like the, the famous phrase principalities of air. I think that's in Paul um, uh, where, you know, you're dealing with demonic entities, not inter um, 
uh, interplanetary extraterrestrial entities. And actually, a lot of Christian ufologists will refer to the Book of Enoch, uh, which is a non-canonical book. Uh, it's non-canonical both for Jews and Christians, but it's still it's an important uh, piece of writing. It dates, I think, third century BCE, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not a scholar of the Book of Enoch, but but um, but what it but what scholars have said about it is you can look at it as almost um, uh, literature based on a particular passage in the book of Genesis, where in Genesis you get the statement about uh, the Elohim uh, the, and the Nephilim, uh, the beings, you know, the Elohim are divine beings who come down to earth and they have sex with women. This is what they're about. And they're, the children are the Nephilim, uh, known as uh, the mighty men, the mighty men of old. I think that's what it is, and the warriors of renown, and that's in Genesis, and that's what you get, the Nephilim. Now, from that, you have the Book of Enoch, um, which is working off of this. Now, Enoch's a pretty crazy story. This much I could we could just say. You got a situation uh, where the Nephilim are there; they're uh, killing and devouring men. They're drinking their blood. It's really kind of graphic stuff. Uh, and in the Book of Enoch, you have the Elohim. They are the watchers. They're fall. They're they're fallen angels, teaching humans to do all kinds of nasty things. At least nasty in the Bible, like occult things, like divination and astrology, and uh, a lot of other nasty things. Um, and the they are the fathers of the Nephilim. So anyway, God eventually sends angels to kick some butt and kick them out. So that's a really bad rendition of the book of Enoch. All of this is part of the uh, what we would call the Jewish apocalyptic texts, again, uh, the 400s, 300s BC, essentially, or thereabouts. Um, and, an interesting thing, by the way, about the book of Enoch is that I think that is the first uh, piece of literature anywhere where you get a genuine description of hell as we understand hell. This is long before Christianity. You get it in the book of Enoch. Anyway, I'm bringing this up here because these types of texts uh, inform Christians who are looking at the abduction phenomenon, okay? Uh, you know, the idea of creating, I mean, you have the idea of hybrids, right? You have the, the, these angels or fallen angels coming, having sex with women, creating a new race. That's a hybrid race. So Christians uh, will look at this and they will look at the abduction phenomenon that with, with this idea of, hey, guess what? This has happened before, and it's right there in the Bible. So, you know, I, I should probably be careful about going too deep on this because I'm going to get in too deep. I'm going to mangle this. Uh, and for that reason, I will be interviewing Timothy Alberino, who knows this much better than I do, and he, I can, he can undoubtedly help me out with this. But essentially, we're talking about an interpretation of a different kind of infiltration uh, grounded in a reading of the Bible, essentially. Uh, the watchers and the Nephilim, the hybrids, basically now being transferred to a modern setting. So in other words, are, uh, are we dealing with extraterrestrials? Or are we dealing with fallen angels or demons? All right. That's really the question. And, you know, people either believe this or they don't believe it. I, there's often not a lot of middle ground here, but the fact is this is a definite interpretation of the whole abduction phenomenon. And with an end game, um, that's also not a good end game. And essentially the ultimate end game from the, the Christian interpretation, um, I think it's fair to say would be a world in which uh, the dark powers are seeking to dominate this world. All right. So of the three, uh, you got four interpretations I've given you. The skeptics, you've got the uh, the non-spiritual, you've got the new age, and you got the Christian. The, the you got the Christian and the and the the materialists are both both are really looking at this as a bad thing. And you got the let's say the new age interpretation, which is looking at this as a basically a wonderful thing, a truly wonderful thing. And then you got one interpretation that says, ah, don't lose sleep over this. A lot of other things in this world to worry about uh, rather than non-existent alien 
uh, abduction. So those are the four that I really try to cover. So here's a question. How do we make sense out of all of this? Are we uh, hopelessly doomed to argue and run around in circles due to completely incompatible worldviews on this? Well, the answer is I don't know. I hope not. All right. What you can say, though, is that there are definite ideological influences on how people view this subject. And so that's a problem when I look at this. Like, I, I don't like that. I don't like the fact that uh, so much of how we understand this seems to depend upon what is our prior ideological disposition when we come in and look at this, all right? So how do you come to a sense of what is real, all right? How do you do that? Well, the only thing I can I can say is like, I'll tell you how I try my best, all right? My own ideology is that I, I try within the limitations that I have in my mind, I try to be evidence-based, evidence-based in how I approach this, but with the realization, with an important realization that we are in fact dealing with a subject that may not easily allow for the kind of scientific testing that say skeptics demand, all right? Maybe there has been a, a level of scientific testing that has taken place in classified circles, could be, but it hasn't happened in the public realm uh, that scientists can imagine, and it may not be as possible as we would like. Um, I think that's really possible. Like I've I've often thought, like you know, in in science, uh, for the scientific method to really have any validity, you, you've got a scientist who's got to be, in theory, they're in control of the experiment. If you're studying microbes or bacteria, or if you're studying uh, you know, meteorites or whatever it is, like you, you're creating uh, your own parameters of what the experiment is going to include and you, you measure and like you're, you're the brains in charge of this operation, not, not the subject under study. But what if the thing you're studying is actually smarter than you? What if the thing you're studying doesn't want you to analyze it? What if it's able to screw with you in different ways that you, like it's running circles around you. What if that's the case? Well, you scientists may not have an easy time in studying this phenomenon. And you can you can say, well, I have no ability to study this scientifically, so I'm just gonna leave it alone. That's your choice. But there's some of us who are like, uh, we think this is kind of important. And even though we are in some ways outmatched by this, we're gonna try anyway. So what I feel is that I think that with, with reasonable limits, or I guess within reasonable limits, we still have the ability to piece together a picture of what's going on that is at least somewhat evidence-based and hopefully not driven by an ideology that is uh, essentially external to the phenomenon itself. So we want an ideology that is not driving our conclusions. This is my opinion. Rather, we want the evidence to drive us to the conclusions, all right? So when you come into this with a strong ideology beforehand, you basically do two things. One is you do give yourself a sense of completeness and like, you know, well, we figured it out. We've got it. That We have a complete uh, answer to this. That's, that's what an ideology can do. That's one thing. That's the benefit of a comprehensive worldview that allows you to fit pretty much everything into it, all right? So the Christian worldview, the New Age worldview, they both do that. They both provide a framework into which you can fit pretty much everything. And they are frameworks that pretty much automatically can lead you to a preordained conclusion about how to interpret alien abduction and alien encounters. Now, that's not to say that they are false. It is not for me to say that they cannot be true either of them. It just means for me that I'm leery of worldviews that seem to me intrinsically leading me to a conclusion about something by the very nature of its ideology, if you follow me, rather than by the evidence of the phenomenon self that I'm studying. All right. Now, I don't say that a materialist or non-spiritual perspective on alien abduction is always likely to be accurate either. It really comes down to the amount of data, the evidence 
that you can acquire um, and how well you can analyze all that. But it seems to me in principle that at least this approach isn't as guilty of leading the witness, so to speak. It seems to me to be more likely an approach uh, that can allow you to follow a scientific method, at least in terms of trying to collect what data you can, trying your best to interpret the data, making your best guess at a conclusion. Now you could say as the skeptical approach is the ultimate employment of the scientific method, and you might be right, except that that approach, if you're really strict about it, uh, in my opinion, seems likely to miss the boat on the true strangeness that, frankly, UFOs and aliens uh, seem to bring us, right? So as I've said countless times, uh, the UFO subject doesn't behave. UFOs don't behave. The aliens don't behave. There's an elusiveness to this, sometimes a contradictory nature to what they do. They don't always make sense, and yet they seem to be here. Uh, so a, a strict scientific attitude of, you know, well, well, there's no proof, so get back to me when you've got some proof. That, to me, that doesn't really cut it either. So for me, I'm left with, let, let's say, the non-spiritual or non-spiritually ideological approach is at least offering the most neutral way to study alien abductions. That's me. That's how I look at this. For the record, I actually have my own spiritual beliefs. I personally think that some uh, truly spiritual elements, let's bring on the woo here, apply to this subject. That's I believe after all these years, like I started out 25 years ago thinking, I don't want to get into any of that weird stuff. Well, guess what? I've, I've encountered a lot of the weird stuff in this field. That's the reality. Um, I believe in the reality of remote viewing, certainly. I believe in the reality of telepathic communications between us and them, them, the aliens. I believe that um, they can manipulate space and time in ways that we cannot. And I happen to believe in, or at least let's say I have faith in, the existence of a soul. And that's my faith. That's my belief. And if that is real, if it is real, then maybe some of these beings also have a soul or a spiritual component. And maybe that's something that's very important in all of this as well. Okay. There's all kinds of hints here and there in abduction research that this actually is the case anyway. Right. So I'm not saying that I'm non spiritual in my attitude about all this, but I think that a non spiritual approach, as I have described it here, offers the least biased or the least um, ideological approach to this subject. And that is not to say, by the way, that I fully agree with all of David Jacobs' conclusions. Uh, actually, I don't have full agreement with it. I've got my own take, for example on the notion of the great change. I'll get into that another time. But I do think that we are very likely dealing with covert infiltration. I do think that. Is this good? Well, you know, uh, the new age people say that it is good. Uh, what we have in this world, think about the um, Think about the subject of transhumanism. It's actually very similar in a lot of ways when you deal with attitudes about transhumanism as we deal with ad attitudes about alien abduction. Uh, there is a kind of almost, I, I want to say, political breakdown to this. It's really not hard to see, right? So you've got, uh, for example, with transhumanism, there are people who believe this is going to be great. We're going to change human, the very human nature itself. Human nature is itself plastic, can be changed. Uh, it's, you know, it's constantly in a change of uh, a state of change. Anyway, we're just going to change it the way we want it to be. You're going to live for 500 years. You're going to have, uh, you know, little nanobots keeping you young all the time in your body. And you're going to have a uh, connect connection to the cloud. And you're going to be like, have an IQ of like 500 or whatever. How awesome that will be. Okay. Maybe. Um, I, I actually am not a fan of transhumanism. I think it's actually going to be a very dangerous uh, anti-human thing, but it may happen anyway. Who that doesn't really matter what I think, frankly. Uh, this could very well happen. But my point is that there are 
people who think transhumanism is going to be an absolutely wonderful and necessary thing, a necessary transformation. And then there are people who are like, this is not what I have in mind for a good future. Um, and it's the same with the alien abduction thing. Um, I think, you know, there's there are folks who are like, we need to go to something beyond what we are. What we are as this current kinds of human beings are really, ultimately they say, we're not good enough. This isn't good enough. We've got to have something that's better, that's beyond. And uh, I do think it is fair to say that among the transhumanists and uh, the ascensionists, let's just say that, uh, there's a utopianism there in both strains that on a personal level, I find uh, dangerous. Uh, I, I actually think utopians uh, tend to be very dangerous people, uh, well-meaning some often, but but dangerous nonetheless. I mean, after all, you know, the greatest totalitarians of the 20th century were all utopians, every last one of them. Uh, so just think about that. Robespierre of the French Revolution, classic utopian. You know, these are not people that you want to let into your house or run your city or your society. Let's face it. Um, and there's a strong utopianism in all of the transhumanists and the ascension communities. And uh, I'm leery of that. So, um, and then on the other hand, there's the skepticism, but is, is total skepticism on transformation a good idea as well? Here's the fact. The human race has been going through changes ever since we've been humans, um, which in my opinion has been many hundreds of thousands of years since we evolved ultimately out of Homo erectus and Homo heidelbergensis. And, you know, if they find any other intermediary species, we've, we have been transforming ourselves for a long time. And since we've had settled agriculture in the last 10,000 years or less, actually, we've been continuing to transform. We're not the same physiologically that we were but when we were hunters and gatherers. We're going through changes physiologically, psychologically, probably brain chemistry. Who knows? All right. And, and it's happening pretty quickly. So it's, it's foolish, I think, for us to think that our uh, destiny is to remain exactly as we are forever. Like, I don't, I just don't think so. So there's some kind of middle ground here in all of this that we're dealing with. That's a whole other issue. So I'm going to wind this down. Um, I, I brought this up again, as I said in the beginning, as a way to uh, have a process of thinking about, of reintegrating important issues into UFO studies or ufology. And I do think that we, um, if we're not careful, we're in danger of losing sight of some of the important elements of this field in the whole realm of talking about disclosure or talking about military UAP or things like that. All of that's important. I'm personally interested in, I'm sure you are, but there's more to the UFO subject than just that. All right. There's a lot of weird, uncomfortable stuff that this subject involves that I think we need to remind ourselves of. And that's why I wanted to talk about these different interpretations of the alien presence here. Um, uh, I look at this as an exploration, not as a definitive, like, there's no way you're going to solve this in one YouTube video. Okay, let's just face it. So this is something that I think will require, uh, and I like, I hope to do this, to come back to this theme in the future maybe explore different aspects, whether it's of the alien presence or other aspects of uh, the UFO phenomenon that are really not getting talked about enough that need it. So um, there you go. I hope, <laughs> hope you found this interesting. It's a little long for uh, uh, some of my recent Richard Olin shows, but there you have it. Hey, I see all of you in the chat room there. I just want to thank the chat family for being here. Uh, I want to thank you for some of the super chats. It was incredibly generous of uh, some of you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the support. Believe me. I want to thank all of you for being here with me. Um, look, if you like this channel, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's the easiest way to support me. Just subscribe to the YouTube channel. You know it's free. You don't have to pay for anything. I've actually had people say, well, does it cost anything? I'm like, come on. This is YouTube. This is the internet. Uh, and also click the notification bell. And if you really like what I do, please go to my website, richardolanmembers.com. I'm much more active there than I am anywhere else. 
Um, I, I will have free content there, so you can just go check it out anytime. And I have a lot of members content there as well. So that's what that's all about. A lot of amazing people hang out there too. Wow. Okay, that's it. Thank you for being here with me. Let's keep fighting the good fight. Later.